opportunity to come together and just declare and proclaim victory yes. because of the blood. Amen.
Lord, we magnify you, King of Kings. We magnify you, Angel of Grace. We declare you alone are worthy to be praised. Glory, glory to your name. Um, Saints, as we just prepare to take up the offering, we just take up the offering. Um, if you are here and you've got a special offering um, or tithe, uh, please just raise your hand and our ushers will serve you with an envelope. Uh, your normal offering will come here into the baskets. Uh, and if you're online, the uh, details will be shared with you on the screen. Or oh, yeah, if you're in the service and you want to use any of the digital touch channels, um, our, our offering details will be uh, on, on the screen. So just remember for those who've got a special offering, to label it where it's going uh, specifically. Now, um, as we prepare to uh, receive this morning's offering... Um, I'm just going to refer to something that uh, Doc referred to uh, a few weeks back. This is the statement which has stuck with me and I've always I've been playing it in my head a lot. It says, it says, we will not experience the power of God if we don't place a demand for it. And this was particularly in, 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 in relation to, to spiritual gifts. Uh, but I believe this also relates even to our giving. We will not experience the power of God unless we place a demand for it. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, it's something that we see through scripture, how men and women in the Bible placed a demand on the power of God by their giving, and they saw the power of God. Amen? Uh, the widow of Zerpath, we will all remember this story, she placed a demand on the power of God by being obedient and serving the men of God to provide for Elijah. So she placed a demand on the power of God. She placed a demand. And she had abundance afterwards. For the duration of that famine, she had provision. Our own father of faith, our father Abraham, placed a demand of God. He offered up his only son Isaac. He placed on the demand of, on the power of God. And as he placed a demand on the power of God, he became the father of many nations. Obedience. King Solomon, you all remember this story. You know, he made a demand on the power of God by offering one of the greatest offerings ever made. The Bible says he offered a thousand burnt offerings. And as soon as he had given God that offering, God literally handed him a blank check. That's what God did. God said to him, ask anything, anything you would want after he had given that offering. Isn't that amazing? How much you're giving your giving, how you give, places a demand on the power of God. Also, in relation to this statement, we can also conclude, you know, you, you will not experience the power of abundance if you don't put a demand on it with your generosity. So if you want to see abundance in your life, you have to place a demand for it. And the demand comes through your giving, your generosity. You will not experience the power of a harvest if you don't place a demand for it by sowing. Every farmer who wants to see the power of harvest sows. And it's a principle. If you don't sow, no harvest. Amen? So if you want to see the power of a harvest, you sow. So let's place a demand on the power of God and God will pull through and God will come through for us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, I want to see the power of God in my life. I want to see the power of God in my finances. I want to see abundance. I want to experience a harvest. So, personally, I will put a demand on the power of God with my soul and with my giving, with my generosity. And I implore you to do the same. Praise the Lord. Well, as we pray, um, and I'm going to ask Russell just to prepare to come up. Um, if you've brought in your offering in the service, as I said, please come and drop it off here in front in the baskets. Or you can use any of our digital channels, uh, which the, the details are up on the screen. Um, as well as those who are online, the details will also be appearing on your screen. Uh, we will pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, thank you that we have an opportunity to place a demand on the heavens, to place a demand on the kingdom, on you, for us, for our families, for our children, with our giving. So, Father, we put our faith down in Jesus' name to trust you, God, that, Father, we, as we give you, as we, as we, as we give our offerings, as we, as, we, as we move generously to those who are around us and to those that we see, that, Father, we will also begin to see the abundance on our lives. We will also begin to see the abundance come to us, to our families, and that all our needs will be met according to your riches and glory in Jesus' name. 
Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you. Uh, please feel free to come and drop your offering right here in front in the baskets. Or you can use uh, any of our channels uh, online. You know, 20 years ago, I, uh, God spoke to my wife and I to, to transition from the church where we had served for almost 19 years to Celebration Church. And I handed in my, our resignation to our pastor. And when I handed in our resignation, we had uh, a lot of conversation with the pastor trying to persuade us to stay. But after a while, he allowed us to, to leave. And one of the things he said to me was to say, you know, Doc, you are... You are going to that church, that church. So he says, which church are you going? I said, no, I will be going to celebration. I feel God has called us celebration. He says, you are going to that church. That is a, that is a big church. You will be a nobody in a big church. And nobody will ever notice you. You will never be a leader in that church. And I said, but pastor, I'm not going to church to be a leader. People go to church to be members, to be ministered to. I have no ambition to be a leader. I... I'm just doing what I feel God is calling us to do. Uh, what do we know beyond a shadow of doubt is that <clears throat> God has called us. We have served faithfully for 20 years. And we believe God has called us to, uh, to transition our membership to Celebration Church. So in 2001, we came to Celebration Church. And we were just serving and loving God and so on. And then things started happening. I remember one time uh, Pastor Tom met me at a VBF, a v Victory Business Forum meeting. And he said, I want you to go and help teach in the Bible school. I mean, he didn't even know me. I mean, we met once when I treated him as a dentist. And when we bumped into each other, he didn't even know that I, whether I can speak or not. Uh, but he asked me to go to the Bible school and help. But needless to say, I didn't go. Because how do you go to, to a director of a Bible school and say... Pastor Tom thinks I can help you. And he says, and if you ask how, he says, I don't know. So I, I didn't go. A year later, he met me again, again at Victory Business Forum. He says, you didn't do what I told you to do. And uh, I want you to go. So anyway, I, I went to, that time at least the, direct, the new director was somebody I knew. So I felt, anyway, at least this is better. I went, spoke to the, the director. He says, oh, that's good to know. And then he forgot about it. And that was the end of it. Anyway, down the line, things happened and God orchestrated things. But on the 21st of um, May in 2006, things had happened and we were being licensed to be ministers of the gospel together with other people. And there was a prophetic presbytery. And a word was given to me, and I want to read that word to you. A number of things were said, but a word that was given by Pastor Tom was this. I'm going to read it verbatim exactly as it is. It says, and even as God sent anchors in the church before, James was an anchor. He wrote, he taught, he secured many because of his steadfastness. I call you James tonight. I call you James tonight. I call you James tonight. As you'll be one of those anchors in the church. You will teach, you'll instruct, you'll keep doctrine pure. You will keep direction straight. There will be many that will seek counsel from you even this night. I'm expanding your spirit in your heart. Hey, enlarge him, Lord. Enlarge my brother. Quicken, quicken to him in his, inner, in his inner man for the work that you have called him to do. Enlarge him. Enlarge his ten pecks of his heart. Now, Father, anoint him from on, high, from on high by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the power of the Holy Ghost, and by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's... In 2006. History will judge whether that prophecy has come true or not. Or whether it has impact or not. But, but the, the thing that I want to say is to say, you know, there is something called a gift of prophecy. The working of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the charisma, the desiring the spiritual gifts. And today I want to focus on the gift of prophecy. So if we will get into the word immediately, quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 1 says, Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. It says, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, 
but especially that you may prophesy. You know, there's a challenge in the body of Christ. We have so many fake prophets. We have so many crazy things happening so that people now begin to shun from prophecy. People begin to shun from what God is saying. But in this scripture, God is saying, I want you to pursue prophecy. He says, pursue spiritual gifts. And he says, particularly, that you may seek to prophesy. You may desire to operate in the gift of prophecy. So God is actually challenging us and saying, we must desire to prophesy. We must desire to move in the gift of prophecy. We must desire to allow God to work in and through us by the gift of prophecy. Hallelujah. So we must desire to prophesy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of gifts, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the, tongue, the interpretation of tongues. So these are manifestations of the Spirit. They are given by the Spirit as He wills, as we have seen. Now again, to go back to our framework, we said the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit or the manifestation gifts are in three categories. They are the discerning gifts, which are the gifts that reveal. And we say under that there are three gifts, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. Then the next are the dynamic gifts or the gifts that do, the gift of faith, the gifts of healings, and the working of miracles. And the final uh, category is another group of three, which are the declarative gifts, the gifts that say. That means the gift of prophecy, the gift of the diverse kinds of tongues or different kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. And today we are focusing on the gift of prophecy. So let's start as we normally do by defining what is the gift of prophecy as the gift given by the Holy Spirit. The gift of prophecy is a sovereign, instantaneous, divinely inspired communication of the mind of God in a human language under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So it's an instantaneous, it's sovereign, means that it doesn't depend on me. The gift of the, the prophecy as a manifestation of the gift of the Holy Spirit is not something I plan. It's something that the Holy Spirit does. It's sovereignly orchestrated. It's done by the Holy Spirit. I can't go and say to people, you know what, I'm going to operate right now in the gift of the Spirit. No, I, you don't program it. It's programmed by the Holy Spirit. It's sovereign. It's instantaneous. It just happens in that moment. You suddenly have that word and God gives you a piece of his mind. And you as a human being, you can communicate a piece of that mind of God. So give you, God gives you a piece of something that he wants to know and, he declare, and you declare it in a language that is understood. And that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, the gift of prophecy results in a product called a prophetic word. And many people say, what is a prophetic word? A prophetic word is simply a specific word of God at a specific time to a specific person or to a specific group of people, mostly spoken through another person. So God, just like the, the example I gave to say, here we are in a prophetic presbytery and Pastor Tom singles me out and he, and he gives a word. He is speaking the mind of God as he perceives it concerning me. So it's a specific word to a specific person at a specific time. So we need to understand that God is still communicating. God is still speaking to his people. But when God speaks, he's speaking his mind. And this is where I have a problem with some of the things that people say and they say this is a prophetic word. I mean, I remember hearing a preacher say, oh, you know what? I mean, somebody giving a testimony saying, oh, the, the man of God is so true. He stood up and he said that my child was going to die and sure enough on Thursday my child died. That is not a word from God. If God gives you a word that is negative, he is telling you either to do something about it. He is telling you so that you can pray to prevent it. Or he is there, something must happen. But God is not in the business of just going to pronounce adversity on people. So you can't celebrate something that is negative. When God reveals his mind, he is revealing it for a purpose so that you can do something about it. Hallelujah. So it's a communication of the mind of God through another person. God wants you to know what is happening. Now there are two dimensions to prophecy. You see, the first dimension is what's called foretelling. This is a declarative aspect of prophecy. You are declaring what God says. This is a, a message that edifies. This is a message that builds up. This is a message that encourages. This is a message that, 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 that helps somebody. You, you know, prophetic words 
can come in different ways. When I say a, a word that gives confirmation, that edifies. Recently, we had a situation when somebody, somebody passed away. They were a child of God. Actually, they were a pastor. And God gave a dream to the daughter who was really worried that she was really heartbroken. And she had a dream. In this dream, the, she, met, she saw the father and says, Dad, why did you leave me? And he says, I'm in a better place. And says, uh, will you come back? And the dad says, no, I'm not coming back. And he says, so, how am I going to make it without? He says, and the, the dad says, this isn't a dream. And the dad says, if you do what I taught you and you hold on to God, everything will be fine. And she says, dad, dad, can I come to you? And this is again in the dream. And the dad says, yes, you will come to me if you will remain true to God, but not now. So yours is to hold on to God. And you can see that that dream is very biblical. Everything that was said was biblical. But here is the thing. This is not a, a prediction. This is a word that is a, a declaration of the mind of God. This child was moving into depression. But that experience arrested her, comforted her, edified her, and exhorted her. And now she is on fire. Now she says, well, I don't know why my dad died, but I know that God is good. So God can give you a, a prophetic word, a word or a gift of prophecy. It may not be predictive. It may just be to encourage you, to comfort you. It may just be something to say, I know what you are going through, but it is okay. I am in control. And it reassures you. So that is what is a forth telling, a declaration of the mind of God. Hallelujah. To bring edification, exhortation, and comfort. The second aspect is foretelling. So a prophetic word or a gift of prophecy can come forth as a prophetic word that is predictive, that gives, that speaks to the future, that speaks about things that are going to happen. So it tells you about future events. Hallelujah. Are we together? Praise God. I'm going to move quickly because we took a little bit longer before we, we got into the word. So the next thing that I want you to understand when you talk about the, the gift of prophecy, you need to understand that prophecy operates at different levels. So I want to share with you uh, about a number of levels of prophecy so that you understand how prophecy works. So the first level of prophecy is the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So, sorry, an aside. I, I noticed uh, one of my good friends, Deacon, did notice that a lot of people are taking photos of the, the PowerPoints. So he came up, he's a clever guy. He came up with an idea which I accepted. He, so you don't have to worry about taking the notes because the, the notes are going to be posted on our Facebook page in PDF or end in our website. So anytime after the service, you can go and just download or, uh, the notes, so you don't have to, to try and get all the notes point by point. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I'm not saying don't write notes. Write notes if you will, but I'm saying you are going to get all the notes. So, the levels of prophecy, the first level of prophecy, which is the basic, which is the entry level, is the gift of prophecy as a manifestation gift. This is what we are talking about. It's really a very basic, it's an entry level. This is for everybody. Remember the Bible says everyone can prophesy. The Holy Spirit as he wills, he can just use anybody in a gift of prophecy. So this is the entry level. This is how we begin in the operation of the, in the word of prophecy. So this is the starting point. And yet many people go out and say, oh, I'm, I'm spiritual. I have the gift of prophecy. No, no, no. This is entry level when it comes to prophecy. This is for everyone. Everybody, anybody can be used by God. You can be used by God to give a prophetic word. You can be used by God to share, to communicate the mind of God. If you are a child of God, the Bible says that with those who are the sons of God, they are led by God. If you are led by God, you hear the voice of God. If you hear the voice of God, it means at some point it's possible for God to be able to use you to give a, a, a word of, a, to give a, a, a prophecy and help somebody and edify somebody. So this is just for exhortation. This is basic. Hallelujah. Are we together? So this is not under your control. It's something that God just uses for the benefit of others. The second level is the ministry of prophecy. 
This is not the prophet. This is the ministry of prophecy. You find it in Romans 12 verse 6 when he talks about the ministry of prophecy. It's the motivational ministry. It's something where somebody is used more frequently. You know, there are people who are prophetic who operate in the ministry of prophecy. These are people who are used more consistently. It's unlike the manifestation gift of prophecy. Because the manifestation gift of prophecy, God may use you in a prophetic word right now. And for five years, he may never give you a prophetic word again. But somebody else is, we operate in the ministry of prophecy. They hear God more often and they are used more often. And this is a manifest, this is a motivational gift. It's a gift that engages. Intercessors normally operate with this gift. Sometimes pastors operate in this gift. So God uses people depending on your, your, the calling of God. He may give you the ministry of prophecy. Are we together? Then the third is the office of the prophet. The office of the, the fact that you have, you, you have been used in a gift of prophecy or that you are operating in the ministry of prophecy does not make you a prophet. Are we together? You can be a prophetic person. You, God gives, uses you more prophetically, but that doesn't make you a prophet. The, gift, the office of a prophet is a governmental gifting. We find it in Ephesians 4 and God gives, it's one of the fivefold ministry gifts that are given by God. So this is a gift that comes from Christ. So if you remember, so the gift of prophecy is a gift given by the Holy Spirit and it's given as he wills and you don't necessarily, pro, you don't necessarily own it. It's not something that say, I have it, I use it at my will. It's a sovereign gifting. Are we together? The second is the, 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 the ministry of prophecy, which is a gift given by the Father. And it's a motivational gift. There's a frequency of use. This is, there's a permanence. It's a gift that when God uses you more frequently and openly in that gifting. The third is the office of a prophet, which is a governmental authority. It's a ministerial office, just like a pastor, like a teacher, like an apostle. So this is somebody who is now operating. This gift is not given by the Holy Spirit. It's not given by the Father. These are gifts given by Jesus Christ. Are we together? Hallelujah. So, don't say because God is used you in the ministry of prophets, then you say, oh, I'm a prophet. And then you begin around and you, you print your card, prophet Julia. And because God used you once, no, 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 no. There are different levels of prophecy. Are we together? Is this making sense? Say to your neighbor, neighbor, he sometimes makes sense. And right now is one of those times. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, the hierarchy or the, the greatness increases as we go down. So the next level is the spirit of prophecy. Now the spirit of prophecy, as Revelation 19.10 says, it says, for the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. You see, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the express image of the Godhead. You see, God spoke through the through Christ Jesus. You see, when you look at the spirit of uh, the spirit of prophecy, you are talking about the manifestation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we say when you judge manifestations of the voice of God, one of the things you do is the testimony of Jesus Christ. You look at the character, the nature of Christ to say, is this consistent with the nature of Christ? Is this consistent with the person of Christ? Is this consistent with who Christ is? Do you remember him saying? to his disciples. I mean, it was John and uh, John, John and James were saying they're passing through Samaria and they say the Samaritans reject Jesus and they say, Lord, you want us to call fire so that we burn them all out. Let's call the fire. I think they were some of the brothers from up north who want to call fire on everybody. So James and John were, were trying to call fire and God says, no, and Jesus says, you know not of what spirit you are. What was he talking about? He's saying, my testimony, the spirit that I have is a, is a prophetic spirit, the spirit that bears testimony to the truth. That's why he says, I bear testimony to the truth. I am the truth. Hallelujah. Praise God. And finally, the absolute gold standard in terms of the prophetic things is the prophecy of scripture. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1 verse 20, it says, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, that's the absolute. So when anything else that is prophetic has to be judged by the gold standard of scripture. Hallelujah. 
So if somebody comes and says, oh, I have a revelation, and this revelation is far beyond scripture, it's the latest, it's a download from heaven, you don't find it in the Bible, and this is the latest, run away with your life. Those people are fake. Because everything has to line with the gold standard. Hallelujah. Praise God. So those are the, the levels of prophecy. But we are focusing on the gift of prophecy. Let's ignore the others for the now. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 3 to 5. The Bible says, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Unless indeed he interprets and the church may receive edification. I want you to see those words which are bold. He says, I wish you all prophesied. So it is God's desire that we all prophesy. Hallelujah. So it's not for an elite class. It's not, you know what, for, for these are the spiritual brothers, these are the spiritual sisters, these are the ones God uses. God says, I want you all to prophesy. That's why he says, I want you to desire all spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. God cannot ask you to desire something that he doesn't want to give. God is not a sadist. You know, somebody who says, I mean, if as a parent, I say to, your child, to my child, you know, whatever you tell me, whatever you desire, and I'll give you. When as they say, now I desire this, then I say, no, although I told you to desire it, I don't want to give you. It's, it's not, God, God is, does not play games with us. When he says desire something, he wants to give it. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, what are the purposes of the gift of prophecy? Number one, we saw already in that scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, that is for edification. Edification is the, the Greek word ekodomi, which means to strengthen, to build up in faith, to profit spiritually. It means to establish, to make effective. So the product of pro, gift of prophecy is to build up. If a word is given to you and it makes you feel dirty, it makes you feel cheap, it makes you feel demotivated, it's not a word from God. Because if it's the gift of prophecy, it edifies, it builds up, it strengthens strengthens you, it encourages you, it gives you hope. If it's not like that, it's not a gift of prophecy. Are we together? It's for exhortation. Exhortation is paraclysis in Greek. It's called alongside to help you. It's for encouragement, for comfort. You see, when God speaks to you, he's strengthening you. When you are kind of disappointed, things are falling apart, and God gives you a word that gives you hope again, a word that encourages you, a word that says you can make it. That is God, the word of God, when it comes as a gift of prophecy, is there for paraclysis, for exhortation, and is there for comfort. And the word comfort is paramethia, which which means to draw near in order to speak smooth, soothing words, comforting words. So God is speaking words that comfort you. When you hear a word that is given as a gift of prophecy and you feel it and say, oh, that is refreshing. That is comforting. Now I have, I have comfort. I am strengthened. I feel well. I feel like God is just watering me. That's how God uses the gift of prophecy. It's for the edification of the body. It's for the building up of the church. It's not for condemnation. If there are, you know, there are some crazy people who go around condemning people and they say, you know, you, you are into witchcraft. You, you are into this. That's not a gift of prophecy. Witch hunting is not prophecy. Accusing people of witchcraft is not a gift of prophecy. It's a divination. It's a demonic. And there's so much of it that's happening in the body of Christ. Anyway, don't, let, get, don't get me started. Let me come, come back to my notes. So, the purpose of the, the gift of prophecy. In 1 Corinthians 14, 24 to 25, the Bible says, If all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, you will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So the, the next purpose of prophecy, 
prophecy is the power to convince, to convict, and to reveal the secrets of the heart. So God may speak something to the heart of somebody. God may reveal something without expo- without embarrassing people. You know, God, when God gives a prophetic word, he can convict even a believer. And he will say something which even the person who is speaking, they don't know. And it, it gives a hook and he say, oh, God caught me. And he doesn't embarrass. But when you see people go around and embarrass you and say, oh, God has shown me that you are into adultery. No, 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 no. God, God does not embarrass people. He can correct you very gently. And when that word is spoken, you actually know what God is talking about. Others around you may not even know, but God is convicting you. But he also convicts unbelievers and he brings them to salvation because God has dealt with them. The next thing is that it becomes a, the prophets can be a witness to unbelievers for the presence of the living God. He says when they see, when they experience the operation of God and the operation of the gift of prophecy, they will recognize that God is in your presence. Hallelujah. Prophecy or the gift of prophecy is a significant tool for spiritual warfare. First Timothy 1.18, remember Paul, Paul is saying to Timothy, remember the words that were spoken to you over in the presbytery. And the, f- use these words to wage warfare in First Timothy 1.18. He says you can use those prophetic words. When God gives you a word of prophecy, you can take that word and begin to wrestle with it. And say, God, you promised it. God, this is what you said to me. While my situation doesn't look like what you said, I believe you, you are going to make it happen. So you hold on to that word. You wrestle with that word. And that word becomes a reality. So that is what God is doing. When he gives you a word, particularly if it resonates in your spirit, you can use that word in spiritual warfare. And you begin to pray. You begin to undo what the enemy is doing. If the situation doesn't align to the word of God, you say, I don't accept your situation because you are not in alignment. God has already spoken by his word and by a prophetic word. This is what God has said to me. And you hold on to that because it's a significant tool for spiritual warfare. Purpose of the gift of prophecy is also to reveal the future. In Acts 21, you remember, uh, 21 verse 11, remember Paul is at the house of Philip and the daughters of Philip are prophesying and then Agabus arrives and Agabus gives a prophetic word and he says, in verse 11 it says, when he, Agabus, had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. So you see, God is telling him what is going to happen. Now he was telling him because he was preparing him. So, and I want you to understand, I've said this often, that whenever God says something, there is a purpose why he is doing that. And you need to understand that purpose. So, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, like these people are doing, when they heard that prophecy, they started trying to, pro- to say, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You can't go to Jerusalem because you'll be arrested. But Paul says, no, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Because God had already said to Paul, Paul, I'm calling you to stand before kings. You'll be a light to the Gentiles, and you will stand before kings. And he knew by the commission of the Holy Spirit, because God had told him. Remember in Acts 20, he had said, guys, I'm living on, I was talking to the elders in, in, at Ephesus. He says, I'm going. I don't know what awaits me in Jerusalem, but what I know in every city, the Holy Spirit is giving testimony that I will be arrested, that chains await me, but I am not ashamed because I am going to fulfill my ministry. Because God he says you would stand before kings. If he had not been arrested, you would not have stood before Herod. You would not have stood before Agrippa. You would not have stood before, before uh, Festus. You would not have stood before Caesar. So this word was actually preparing him. It was not to say don't go. So we need to understand that when a gift of prophecy comes, you are given a word. It requires interpretation. You need to understand. You interpret it in the light of everything that God is telling you. You interpret it in the light of the word of God. You interpret it in the light of the witness that God is giving you. Are we, are we together? Say to your neighbor, neighbor. He is still making sense. At least I hope so. The next purpose of the gift of prophecy. Prophecy convinces the lost that God is real and present. We have already talked about when the secrets of men's hearts are revealed in 1 Corinthians 14. That they fall to their face and they say God is among you. Those are the purposes of the gift of prophecy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I want to take a little bit of time to just 
uh, to just take a little bit of time to give a little bit of biblical guidelines because there's a lot of abuse when it comes to prophecy. Now, the first guideline is number one, number one is that stay within your level of faith and grace. Don't try to prophesy above your pay grade. Remember we talked about levels, prophecy? Now, if, if you if you just have a gift of prophecy, just for exhortation, and you now want to be predictive, you are not working in your grace. Are, are we together? You see, a person with the office of a prophet may be called to give a prophetic word to authority figures. But it's very rare for a person with just a gift of prophecy, unless they are related to the authority figure, to be called by God to go and speak to authority figures. Are we together? And the Bible says in Romans 12, 6b, it says, if you, are, if you minister, if you are called to prophecy, pro, if you are called to prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. In other words, your prophesying should be proportional to your faith. You see, God gives you a faith that enables you to prophesy. If the thing that you are seeing and you are hearing is way beyond your faith, then you are, you are not supposed to release it. Just begin to pray and say, Lord, prepare me or use somebody else because you shouldn't prophesy beyond your level of faith. That's what the Bible is saying. Number two, exercise self-control. Now, this is a huge one. 1 Corinthians 14, 32. It says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. I remember hearing one, one brother going around and saying, you know, when prophetic people you speak, you should just immediately act on it. You must not think about it. And when the you know, prophets are just abrupt, they just say whatever they want because when the spirit comes upon them, they just do things. That's a lie. The Holy Spirit is not a demon. He doesn't possess people. The Bible says in that scripture, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So you can't just, while we are worshiping, you just you can't just go and begin to say, Shaka, ba, 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 ba. The God says, God says, out of ten. You know, there is order. If you do it out of ten, we may just tap you on the shoulder and say, brother, thank you so much for your prophecy. Keep quiet. And you can't turn around and say, Doc, you are trying to, you are trying to, 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 you are frustrating the Holy Spirit. Yes, I'm allowed to frustrate the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit that you are claiming is in you. Because the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. So the fact that the spirit of God has revealed something to you, it doesn't make it urgent. Say you can break protocol, you can break guidelines and just utter things. I've, had, I've been in services where people just come in the middle of a, a, a preaching like this. Somebody begins to, to shake and they say things and that is demonic. It's not God. Are we together? So, when you have a word, the gift of prophecy comes on you. You hear a word. You wait your turn. There are structures. You go to an elder. You follow the guidance given by the leaders. If they say, if you have a prophetic word, like I am saying for this church, if God gives you a word during a worship service or even during the weekend, you think it needs to be shared. You come to one of the pastors, you share that word, and they are going to judge that word and decide when it's going to be shared. You don't decide when it's going to be shared. The leadership will decide. Are, are we together? Amen, somebody. So number three is allow your ministry to be judged. First Corinthians 14, 29 says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. So people say, oh, no, you know what? I, I'm speaking, I'm speaking by the unction of God. So you can't judge me. You can't judge the Holy Spirit. No, the scripture is saying, let the others judge. So when you have a gift of prophecy, when you have a word, it must be submitted to the judgment of the elders. It must be submitted to the judgment of the leaders to say, this word, is, is it appropriate? It may be a word from God, but it may be the wrong time for it to be released. If you release a word at a time which is inappropriate, it causes confusion. It may be a true word. Hallelujah. I, 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 rem I remember one time in uh, Celebration Church, Borodale, somebody stood up and they said, you know, um, God has spoken and said, we must give it to the president. We, it, was a, it was when the leadership said and they, they judged the prophet, they felt that this was a prophetic word. It was true. But it took eight months to be able to 
organize, to see the appropriate time, and then be vetted to be able to go and give the gift. Three years later, somebody else during the service stood up and they said, shaka, 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 ba, 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 ba. God says, we must give another gift to the president. And the leadership says, no, thank you so much, we are not giving. So allow your, your word to be judged. First Corinthians 14, 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. So we must follow guidelines. Is this making sense? Praise God. I know some of you are saying, oh, you said we must judge prophecy. Why should we judge prophecy? I mean, this is the Holy Spirit. Why should we judge prophecy? Let me give you reasons why prophecy should be judged. Number one, because the word itself says that you, the, the others must judge. So the word says we must judge prophecy. Number two, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20, 21 says, do not despise prophecies. So while people are fake, where there is fake, we must not despise prophecy. We must, we must respect prophecy. But the Bible says, test all things and hold fast to that which is good. So when a gift of prophecy is manifested, when somebody gives you a word of prophecy, you need to judge it. You need to test it. If it's not good, don't hold it. The Bible says, hold fast to that which is good. So if it is not good, just say, thank you so much. No thanks. Pastor Tom often says, you must be as wise as an old cow. Because an old cow, when it chews the card, it, it chews the card and it throws out the sticks. But many believers, they take the card, the sticks, everything, and then they have constipation. And they wonder why. Because the, the cow is wiser than them. So, prophecy is judged. Because prophecy is not at the same level with the written word. It's judged against the word of God. It's judged against the spirit of Christ. Prophecy is judged also because it comes through human beings. And human beings are fallible. People can make mistakes. I can hear a word from God and I interpret it wrongly. You see, most of the times when people give a prophetic word, they don't tell you exactly what God told you. They interpret it. That interpretation may be wrong. Are we together? Let me give you a very simple, simple example. I was in a service once and uh, a minister was ministering and he said uh, there, there's somebody who has appendicitis and, uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit right here in this corner, somebody has an appendicitis and there's nobody who would stand up. He says, I know beyond a shadow of doubt the Holy Spirit is telling me somebody has an appendicitis and nobody responded. And we were beginning to be embarrassed for the minister. Because he was so sure and he was so convinced. He actually says, actually it's about on the third row. That's how sure he was. Until he, he changed and he said, somebody is feeling pain on their side. And then somebody stood up. So, it was a true word. But God had just shown him that somebody has pain on the side. But because of the little that he knows, he thought it was appendicitis. And, but this person had actually been to the doctors and the appendicitis had been ruled out. That's why they didn't stand up. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why we need to judge prophets because some of the things that people say, they, they, what God showed them was pain on the side. But what they declared was appendicitis. So the revelation was correct. But the interpretation and the, how it was communicated was wrong. That's why we need to judge prophecy. Are, are we together? Number three, we judge prophecy because prophecy by its nature is subjective. If it's subjective, it needs to be held to something that's objective, which is the word of God. And finally, the Bible says that there will be lots of false prophecies. So for you to be able to discard which is false, you need to understand that which is right. Hallelujah. Praise God. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, I think... He is teaching good. I'm telling you this neighbor just to encourage him. So the next thing I want to talk about is when we talk about judging prophecy, there are different levels of judging prophecy. Basically, there are three. Three levels at which prophecy is judged. The first level is you must judge the word that you have received yourself. So you judge yourself. You, if you have a gift of prophecy, this word comes upon you. Before you just utter it out, judge it. Run through the scripture and say, is, is this biblical? Is, uh, does this align with the scripture? You see, First Corinthians 14.32 says, The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. 
So if the word comes, I must be able to judge it myself. Before I just expose myself, I run it through scripture and I say, is this consistent with what scripture says? Remember the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. So before you even think of other people judging you, you judge yourself. Hallelujah. The second level is other prophetic ministries. Remember, I've already told you that the Bible says that uh, when, when somebody speaks in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let the others judge. So allow the others to judge. And level number three is the leadership of the church. The leadership of the church should be able to judge the word that you are going to bring to the church. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. So you submit yourself, you submit your revelation, you submit that experience to the elders so that they judge. Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so joyfully and not with the grief for that would be unprofitable to you. So prophecy is judged. Hallelujah. So let me say a few more things and then we close. So how do I get to exercise this gift of prophecy? What are the kind of things that should I can do to prepare myself? Remember we said that the gift of prophecy is instantaneous, it's sovereign, it's as the Holy Spirit wills. So I can't program it, but I can prepare myself and be available. So how do you prepare yourself? Number one, you prepare yourself by having the knowledge, being convinced that the Holy Spirit can use you to prophesy. He wants to and he can use you. First Corinthians 14.31 says this, For you can all prophesy. Did you hear that? It's in the book. It's not me. It says, for you can all prophesy. So the Holy Spirit can use each one of us, any one of us. So there's no one who is disqualified. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn, that all may be encouraged. So you must be convinced. You must have revelation. Remember we said that in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, my brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. One of the ignorance that people have is that we think it's for somebody else. The Holy Spirit is going to use other people, but he cannot use me. But scripture here is saying he can and will use you. So you must be convinced. You must be sure that you can be used by God. Number two, you must desire to prophesy. We have 1 Corinthians 14 39 says, therefore brethren desire earnestly to prophesy. Not only should you know that he can use you, you should desire to be used by God. You should desire to prophesy. And that's what the Bible is saying. Number three, Three, be sensitive to what bubbles in your spirit. Because one of the Hebrew words, that means prophesy is a nabi. It means a bubbling up. If you hear while you are worshiping, while you are in the presence of God, and there's a bubbling up in your spirit, become sensitive to that bubbling and say, let me see what is the Holy Spirit saying. Begin to communicate with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, are you trying to communicate? Are you trying to say something? And as you communicate, as you fellowship with him, he gives you something that bubbles out. He gives you the revelation. Number four, pray in tongues. Because the more you pray in tongues, the more you receive revelation. 1 Corinthians 14, 5 says, I wish, all, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. You see, when you are praying in tongues, the Bible says you are charging yourself, you are building yourself in your most holy faith. You are charging your spiritual battle, your spiritual battle. As you do that, the Holy Spirit is able to use you as you pray. So the more you pray in tongues, the more you speak in tongues, and the more you pray, the more you are available to be used by God. Hallelujah. And finally, prophesy in proportion to your faith like we have said. So I close. The gift of prophecy is important and critical in this moment. It is critical because I mean, most of us Pentecostals, we, we, we love to speak in tongues. We pray for people to speak in tongues. But the scripture says, I would rather you prophesy than speaking in tongues. He says, it's better to prophesy than to speak in tongues. He says, he who speaks in tongues is greater than he. Sorry, he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. And yet we don't desire speaking in tongues. We don't desire the greater gift. I think something is wrong with our 
our thinking. Don't you think so? So the Bible actually urges us to desire and to pursue the gift of prophecy. It admonishes us not to despise prophecy, but rather to judge it and to hold that which is good. Because this gift will edify the church. This gift will exhort the church. This gift will comfort the church. This gift will strengthen the church. This gift will empower the church. This gift will demonstrate the presence of God in the church. So many people say, oh, I don't want to prophesy. I don't want the gift of prophecy because there's so much, so much that is fake. But you see, the Bible clearly shows us, like I said when we started this series, that the way to avoid abuse is not or to avoid misuse, is not to use, but to use the gifts correctly. To be informed, to be knowledgeable, and to operate in the gifts as God allows us. So I want us all to stand for a moment. The Bible says here that I want you to desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. I want you to pray a prayer that I know most of you have never prayed. I want you to pray and say, Lord, you said we can all prophesy. I desire earnestly to prophesy. Whenever you will, at your time, you choose the moment, you choose the situation, but I desire to prophesy that I may bless others. Come on, let's just talk to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for revelation. We thank you for understanding. We thank you for clarity. We thank you, oh my God, in the name of Jesus for the gift of prophecy. Father, you are willing, you are ready to communicate, to share your mind, to communicate the mind of Christ. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, that you may, as we desire to prophesy, as we desire to operate in the gift of prophecy. Father, as your people desire to operate in this gift, Father, release that gifting in our lives. Release that gifting in the people of God. Father, we declare in the name of Jesus. Father, you are empowering the church. You are releasing a prophetic ministry in this body. You are releasing the operation of the gifts of the spirit and the gifts of prophecy in the lives of your people. Father, right here in church, right in the marketplace, right in boardrooms, right in the workplace. Father, we thank you for the operation of the gift of prophecy in the lives of your people. Father, we release that gifting. We release the power of God. Father, as we desire it, as we covet the spiritual gifts, as we desire desire them, we ask my God that for that which you have asked us to desire we ask for it in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit for your glory and for your honor in Jesus name. We thank you Father for the church is comforted. The church is built up in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just give God a round of applause. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and take your seats for a moment. I know we are running a little bit late and I apologize for that. But, but I want to pray with somebody who may be here. You may be here in the auditorium or you are listening to me over YouTube, over Facebook, online, wherever you are listening to me. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, if your sins are not forgiven you and you don't know where you go when you die, I want to pray with you. You see, we said the highest form of prophecy is the word of God. And the prophetic word from the word of God says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And today, if you will call on the name of the Lord, if you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be given the right to become a child of God. Your sins will be forgiven. You, you'll be washed in the blood of Jesus and you'll be made a child of God. You become a vessel that God can use. So I'll ask every head bowed, every eye closed. And I want to pray with somebody who is saying, I want my sins forgiven me. I want to have a relationship with God. I want to know that when I die, I go to heaven. So if you don't know where you will go if you die, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray with you. God wants to forgive sins, to heal people. Every head bowed. And I'm going to ask you to pray aloud with me. If you have raised your hand or you are in the 
audience, you are watching us by, on YouTube and you want Jesus to come into your heart. Pray together with me and say, Father God. Everybody pray with me. Say, Father God. I come to you right now. In the name of Jesus. I have sinned against you. And I have failed you. Today I repent of my sins. I come back to you. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Make me a child of God. I reject sin. I accept Christ. I believe that Jesus died. And on the third day he rose again. As Lord of Lords. And King of Kings. So Jesus. I proclaim you my Lord. My Savior. And my King. In Jesus name. Amen and Amen. If you prayed with us over the airwaves. This prayer, I want you to reach out and inbox us and we'll be able to minister to you. Thank you so much and God bless you. Now, this is what I want us to do. I'm tired of believers who come to church with the needs and leave church with their needs unmet. Because we have not created a platform where people can bring their prayer requests and we can pray. We don't want detail that tells who you are. If, for example, it's, uh, pray for my mother who is this, this, tell the condition and we pray. If you, whatever it is. So, every Sunday what we are going to do, we are going to have a pastor come here and they will have the list of the prayer requests. Read out those prayer requests and we as a congregation are going to stand and agree in prayer. I know many times we say, oh, send your prayer requests. We don't even know whether somebody is praying or not. But we are going to pray publicly. When God answers, not if, when God answers the prayers, we want you to write back and say, you, we, you prayed for this and this is what has happened. Our God is in the process of healing people and doing miracles.